Brothers and sisters in Christ, wow, pretty strong gospel. It's always haunted me because uh, I always thought I could do more, and I could have. I absolutely could have. And, um, you know, I grew up uh, actually about 15 minutes from one of the poorest areas in Canada. It's called the downtown east side in Vancouver. And I remember um, going through there many different times and seeing 22, 23, 28 year old guys, strong guys, but addicted and just out cold on the street uh, in the midst of a drug rush, uh, two in the afternoon. And um, being told, you know, uh, yeah, they're into the midst of their addiction and there's not much you can do right now. And uh, wondering, is there anything that could be done? And that was more obvious. Um, many hands were out. And there was only, always only so many ways that one could reach into one's pocket and give a bit of change, if indeed that happened. But of course, what we get tonight is something far more far-reaching than that. Today, I was at Our Lady of Lourdes Parish, and before Mass, one of the um, young boys was asked by one of the priests at the celebration, so are you a sheep or a goat? The kid was sharp. He immediately said, I am a sheep. Well, so either he knew the gospel or, I don't know, sharp kid. He didn't lose a beat. But, you know, it would be simplistic or even disappointing if we viewed the parable of the sheep and goats as we're going to be a sheep so that we avoid um, the hellfire and damnation of the goat. And um, who's a goat and who's a sheep? Because our Savior comes to seek out all the lost, all the sheep. In fact, he, everything in the scriptures says, you know, look at, the, look at the juxtaposition of the goats and the sheep. But he desires to save all his people. And um, the way of the goat is the weeping and gnashing of teeth of the missed opportunity. Let's go to the first reading, Ezekiel. You know, on the Feast of Christ the King, this is a time to ask ourselves, what is king in my life? I mean, what is? Not just who, but what? You know, Pope Pius XI, a little over 100 years ago, or about 100 years ago, established this feast in an encyclical called Quas Primas. And he was not only responding to the increasing movement in the uh, early 20th century to atheism and secularism. But as you know, some of you know, just had come off the worst war in history, at least to that point, World War I. What had happened in World War I? Uh, it was a terrible war, trench warfare. And many, many young people, young men and, and probably some young women, um, you know, they were killed in a brutal, brutal, uh, literally person-to-person -person combat. And it was an ugly, ugly war. Mustard gas uh, just blew out people's lungs. They burned as they died. It was terrible. So it was called the war to end all wars, eh? And yet what happened? A mere 20 years later. So in the midst of all of this, the Holy Father of the time was calling the world to reflect on true kingship and who is the king. Now our faith had said a lot about this already. Lots in the Old Testament. Very brief summary though. The prophet Ezekiel is reflecting on a time um, in his con context, which was a terrible time. Some would say the worst time in Israel's history. All of Israel had been deported on the, in the Babylonian captivity. Their temple, their land had been just destroyed. They were absolutely demoralized. And the interpretation was because they had not been faithful. Not that God did a bad thing to them, but the repercussion of their separation from the, the commands and the ways and the heart of God was this state of affairs. And so the prophet is calling them back, and in part through the prophecy that the Lord God will search and seek out his sheep. 
And uh, now this is not a new motif. Go back to Deuteronomy as another example, one of the great early books of the Old Testament. And very briefly, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's three warnings to the kings of Israel. They are to be the best of God, not the worst of men. They are not to be tyrants if you're a king. You are to have the heart and mind of God. In Deuteronomy, and I won't read the passage, the king must not acquire horses, or he must not return to Egypt, his false ways where promise seemed to be. He must uh, not acquire many wives. In those days, the boys had many wives, you know. But the reason why they did is because it enhanced their stature. They would connect to many tribes and nations as a king by having a wife from, you know, different places. And then, of course, they were not to have gold and silver as their, as their quest. They were not to accumulate riches for their own sake. You may wonder about the horses. Why were they warned about not having too many horses? Well, horses in the time of the Old Testament were the tanks and the F-15s, or F-18s now or whatever, of today. You know, uh, if you wanted to be a military power in the world, you have lots of horses and chariots to extend your power. That was the armament of war and power. So, this is all being laid out in the Old Testament. And in contrast to the, the king who seeks this kind of power and kingship is the shepherd. Now, shepherds are not glorious people. They're businessmen may, may, by many ways, and they tend a flock, and uh, if they can tend and protect the sheep, they get a return, they make a living. Jump forward to the New Testament. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he is the good shepherd if one of a hundred is lost and 99 are okay. He leaves the 99 and he seeks the one. Now, the businessmen and women out there, this is a bit of, this is a bit nuts. Why? 99 out of 100 is pretty good. You've done a pretty good job on the return on your investment. But this is not the good shepherd. <laughs> the good shepherd is not motivated by merely this level of affairs. The good shepherd cares for each one of his sheep. And if one is lost and the 99 are safe, he seeks out the one who's lost. He's, he's not playing the numbers game. This is the leader, the king, that God is holding up in the scriptures. You know, um, then we go to uh, the gospel. And the gospel, as I said earlier, talks about the way of the sheep and the goats. And again, as I said earlier, the good shepherd is seeking all. He wants no one to end up in the way of the goat. Um, for a moment here, I ask you to think about how Christ's kingship is unique in your mind and in your heart. You know, um, we had great kings in the Old Testament. Moses was a type of king, certainly King David. But none of them absolutely perfect. None of them could go all the way. How does Jesus go all the way and show us an absolutely mind-boggling way of kingship? Well, one chapter in Matthew's gospel is a massive key. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 starts out with the great Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what is right. Blessed are the pure of heart. You know, all of the... These are the teaching early in Christ's ministry that tells us and fills out the way of the two greatest commandments, which fulfill the Ten Commandments. So that's pretty good. It's a little bit, you know, more, more challenging. Why should I be meek? Why should I be poor? Why should I um, uh, hunger and thirst for what is right? Well, I'm still hungering and thirsting for what will fill and satisfy. And then right after that is the call to be light and salt. We are to be examples of Christ in our lives. And if we are truly his disciples, 
We are to bring light to the darkness and grayness around us, as Christ does absolutely, and we are to bring flavor. We are to bring life, as salt does to things. Well, then it gets a little more challenging and even bizarre. If your enemy strikes you on one cheek, this is all in chapter 5, later, turn and give him the other cheek. Really, if your enemy steals your coat and sues for it, give him your cloak as well. Oh, that makes sense. You hear where this is going. Um, I've already preached about this to some of you once. I heard a powerful homily from an old uh, crotchety priest. He was a Maltese canon lawyer. And he had no time for foolishness. He suffered fools poorly, as they say. He was preaching on this when I was a young priest, again, not that long ago. And I remember him saying, have you ever heard anything more ludicrous in your life? If your enemy steals your coat, give him your shirt as well. And they have this Maltese expression, this is crazy. Absolutely crazy, stupido let alone if someone hits you, you're going to let him hit you again? Absolutely ludicrous. And I was in a community of Dutch farmers in Chilliwack. They all nodded their heads. They absolutely agreed, right? You know, I wouldn't, not, not just Dutch farmers would agree. We, everybody probably would agree. Um, then he concluded with the following statement. But then he did something even more crazy and stupid. He gave himself absolutely the king of kings, the most powerful God-man, the only one ever, all the way to the point of death on a cross. It was this stupid, crazy, pathetic way that was the only way that saved the world. So I put to you on the Feast of Christ the King, we got an awful lot to look at here awful lot. I do too, you know. And uh, I got to say as a young man, when I was discerning what I would do with my life, where I would go with my faith, it was the way of Christ that I radically and absolutely had to look at when I was traveling around the world and searching for where I would go. That spoke to me. You see, Jesus Christ is not only the historical political answer to the problem of needless and empty conflict, a war, and power struggles. Uh, He's that and more. He is not only the answer for those who seek an absolutely way of, of loving and caring and holding up others in the most desperate situations. And this goes to all the nations of the earth. He is that and more. And so I thank the pilgrims on World Youth Day for giving us a glimpse of an essential feature of making Christ one's king. It can't just be a logical, political, theological kind of conclusion we come to. And oh, it needs to be that as well. But also it has to involve personally knowing Jesus Christ, encountering the Lord. And I'm not saying it just happens through World Youth Day. I mean, they went on behalf of us. And we continue to encounter the the Lord Jesus Christ in many ways. But we must encounter him personally. If we are not united in the Lord, it's pretty tough to uh, live our Catholic faith. It's pretty tough to be merely a member of a church and not part of the mind and heart of Christ. So on the Feast of Christ the King, this is a day of renewal as we look back to look ahead. Blessings to you all, and God bless you as we end this church year and begin a new one in Advent. God bless you.